Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim Bolger and uh, our format consists of the following. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak up to about maybe an hour or so. Then we'll have our questions uh, to our speaker about the, the speech or whatever. And then we'll have our infamous rebuttal period. Generally, we uh, stop about nine o'clock or so. And uh, and there's two rules to the college. One is one fool at a time. Second is no personal attacks. That means I can't call Charlie a schmuck, though I want to half the time anyway. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you're ready, Charlie, I'll get the schedule up and uh, let's get on with the announcements period. And then we'll go from there and uh, move on. So whenever you're ready, go ahead, Charlie. Okay, welcome everyone to meeting number 3000. 681 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. As usual, I will recommend that everyone subscribe to our email Google group and you get one or two program announcements uh, telling you on, about the upcoming program. And we also have a meetup group which functions in much the same fashion. So it only takes a few seconds and right in central top of our website are the links for doing so. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On September the 3rd, our special speaker, special Labor Day speaker will be yours truly, Charles Paydock, and I put together what I say is an award-winning presentation on the history of the factory and how we came to live in a factory-made world. I've got a lot of facts about this, including some discussion that a factory is perhaps not the best thing that you would want it to be put in your town, amazingly enough, contrary to popular belief. Anyhow, it should be a good and interesting presentation with a myriad of, myriad of facts from all directions. Okay, moving into September the 10th, we're gonna be talking about the philosophy of anxiety. Anxiety is basically the fear of the unknown. And I believe we are living in an age of anxiety. Anyhow, that's September the, the 10th, um, uh, Mr. Sherrod will be leading the program. Transitioning into September 17th, we have one speaker booked, Jan Lee. We need two others. We're gonna have something like an open mic format again. What this means is we have keynote speakers for five or 10 minutes, and then we open it up and everybody can give their views. And the topic will be, how would you describe the world? I know how I would describe it. Anyhow, if you haven't spoken before to the college, this is a good chance uh, to test, uh, test it out. I need two more speakers, hopefully, but it's all systems go uh, at present with this program and it should be Led, led into a good, good amount of discussion. So how would you describe the world? Okay, on September the 24th, this was just booked, an author, uh, an academic from the New York system, uh, college system in Syracuse, um, Matthew uh, Uber, and he's got a book on climate change and class warfare, how we are going to be building socialism. That's it, it's, it's coming, man. How we're gonna be building socialism as a result of dealing with climate change. This should be another good topic. Yeah. Um, transitioning into October, that means we have five dates open in October. Uh, so if you're interested in speaking or know someone that we should invite, please let me know. Okay, Tim, that's it for me. 
take it away. Okay. Next, what we want to do is, and I'm going to let the speaker introduce herself, Mariana Minnick it is. Is that how your name's pronounced? Yeah, Marina Minnick, yep. Okay, Marina Minnick, introduce yourself and uh, the floor is yours. Um, remember everybody, please mute during the presentation so that uh, you know we can hear her clearly and not have any background noise. Um, so with that, uh, I'll uh, let everybody go. So Mariana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tim. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Marina Minnick. I'm the Solar Programs Administrator at Citizens Utility Board. Um, thank you for having me at your meeting tonight. Very excited to share with you all some information about um, solar. So I guess I titled the presentation Navigating Solar Options with Cub. So I'm hoping tonight will be a bit more informative rather than potentially controversial, um, just giving people resources and information about how you would go about going solar in a way that best works for you, if you are interested. So throughout the presentation, I'll start off with giving a bit of back, um, background on Citizens Utility Board. I'll also skim over some clean energy legislation, and then I'll go through uh, rooftop solar, so basics, incentives, and different avenues in which you can access that. Uh, I'll then go into community solar, um, and I'll end with a program called Solar for All. All right, so to start off with CUB, uh, so the Illinois General Assembly created CUB in 1983 through the CUB Act, but we are now um, separate, just a nonprofit and a nonpartisan organization. We mainly focus on representing rate pairs, utility rate pairs all across the state of Illinois. Um, so if you pay a gas or electric bill, we are working to help keep your rates down as much as possible and helping people to navigate paying their bills and making sure they're signed up with all the right programs. So energy efficiency programs, assistance programs, anything that will keep those bills as low as possible. Um, we've also expanded into looking at phone, cable, Wi-Fi um, bills as well, because those can often be pretty confusing and Some of our services include, uh, we have a hotline, which is listed on the screen. So this hotline runs Monday through Friday, nine to four. And you can call at any time you have a concern or question about your bills um, or anything utility related, really. We also have our website, citizensutilityboard.org. Uh, we have dozens of fact sheets there um, where you can go and learn more about things like solar or energy efficiency or how to be more green. Um, and then we also do around 500 outreach events a year, similar to, you know, tonight I'm here to speak to you all. Um, other types of events we do, um, tabling events at resource fairs, different presentations, and then we do something called utility bill clinics or UBCs. And this is when um, people can come in with their physical bills in hand and they'll sit down with a CUB staff member and we'll go through those bills with you um, just to make sure that nothing strange is happening or that you're not signed up for maybe an alternative supplier who's giving you a bad deal. Um, so those are helpful and we offer them virtually too. If you ever are curious um, to learn more about your bills or see if there's anything you can improve upon, you can email uh, ubc at citizensutilityboard.org to set up a virtual consultation. So that's a bit of background on CUB. Uh, so now we can dive right into the presentation. Um, so first, um, to give some background on solar, how is it possible? So there are a lot of things going into making solar possible for your average day person, including state and federal incentives and technological advancements that have made the cost of solar price competitive with other incumbent forms of uh, electricity. So to get into kind of those state incentives and the background for those, I wanted to talk about the legislation um, in Illinois that deals with solar. So um, I'm sure some of you are familiar, but back in 2016 with the passage of the Future Energy Jobs Act, um, this created a lot of the incentive programs that we still have today. So 
the two main things that this did, that FIJA did, um, are Illinois Shines and Illinois Solar for All. These two programs are state solar incentive programs. So this is how the state is kind of convincing and incentivizing people to go solar. And through these two programs, you can get both rooftop solar and community solar as kind of an everyday person. So I'll talk about more of those in depth later on in the presentation. And then just this fall, 2021, we passed the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, and this really strengthened and expanded both of those pro uh, programs. So Illinois Shines, for example, had run out of funding, and we were seeing kind of the solar cliff where there were a lot of applications to get these state incentives for these solar projects, but the funding was out. So CJA kind of re-upped that program, and now we'll be good to go for the next few years, we're hoping. Um, and CJA also added um, three new subcategories to the Illinois Shines program. So it added a specific category for solar on schools, on public schools, uh, something called community driven community solar, which I'll get into, and then also an equitable el equity eligible section to um, more highly benefit BIPOC contractors. It also set a goal to achieve 50% renewable generation by 2040 in the state of Illinois, and it increased the Illinois Solar for All budget from 10 million a year to 50 million. All right, so now we can um, kind of focus in on rooftop solar and what those incentives would look like. So first I'll go through the federal tax incentive. So this um, is, a tax credit uh, from the federal government that will reduce what you owe on your income taxes is currently set at 30%. And this is actually new news, um, the signing of the Inflation Reduction Act, which I believe was signed last week. So because of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, that tax credit will now be set at 30% for the next 10 years. And it um, kind of starts back in January 1st, 2022. So any project that was connected to the grid since January 1st of 2022 will qualify for this 30% tax credit. Um, the tax credit includes labor, system installation, interconnection wiring, and batteries. And before the Inflation Reduction Act, this credit was actually set at 26% and was going to expire by 2024. And it also did not include batteries. So now we have it guaranteed for the next 10 years and we have batteries. So, you know, this incentive is only useful if you owe income taxes. Um, and if it is greater than what you owe uh, one year in income taxes, it will roll over year to year uh, for as long as this credit is guaranteed. So essentially, if you went solar this year, it's um, guaranteed to roll over for the next 10 years. Um, so that is all I have on that credit, but 30% of your project, that's a pretty significant amount. Next, we can get to the state solar renewable energy credits. So this is the incentive that comes from that Illinois Shines um, state incentive program, which was, as I said, created by FIJA and expanded and re-upped by CJA. And the reason it, why it exists is because Illinois does have this goal to reach 50% renewable energy by 2040. And when people go solar on their homes, they want to be able to pay you, or they want to be able to count that solar toward their um, overall goal, but they can't just claim your production without paying you for it. So that's kind of the reason this incentive exists. And essentially how it works is when a solar installer puts panels on your home, um, you know, those panels are going to power your home and the installer is going to, um, estimate how much electricity those panels will produce over the course of 15 years. That unit of energy will then be multiplied by a dollar amount, which is the price of the REC, and you will receive that incentive in the form of a check. It comes from the state and they hand it off to your installer who then hands it off to you around 10 months after your system is connected to the grid. Um, this is a pretty great incentive because it covers around 40 to 45 percent of the project cost, um, which is a huge chunk. It used to be closer to 30 to 35 percent, but the Illinois Power Agency published updated REC prices on August 1st. So basically that um, 
cost per renewable energy credit or price per renewable energy credit went from $68 to 82, which is a pretty significant jump, which that's why we're seeing now, you know, 70 to 75% of your project costs covered with the federal and state incentives combined. So if you are thinking about going solar, you're really only paying around 30% of the original cost at this point, um, which is pretty great. One thing I will note is, of course, you, um, you're not getting this tax credit and uh, state credits or state um, incentives until later, probably, you know, 10 months later. So even though your solar panels may have costed 20,000 originally, and after the credits will look closer to, you know, 7,000 or so, um, you still need to get a bridge loan or some type of loan to cover that gap. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. It's not like you're only gonna pay that 30%. Um, you do need to cover the upfront costs with some type of bridge loan. And then lastly, another way to pay your system back faster is through utility net metering. So to kind of explain this, when you do get panels on your home, that electricity produced will go to power your home and any excess electricity produced or any time that you produce more electricity than you're currently using, that will be sent back to your utility grid. Um, it will go through an electric meter. So that meter will keep track of the amount of electricity sent back to the grid. And then your utility will credit you for that amount of electricity on your electric bill. So um, sometimes you may have more credits than your bill is even worth. So they will roll over from month to month and they will expire annually at the end of April. Um, utility net metering is pretty great. You're in most territories in Illinois, you're guaranteed a one-to-one -one rate, which means you will be credited at the same rate that you are charged for electricity. Um, so with these three things together, you're getting um, pretty good uh, money back for those panels. Um, so now if those incentives sounded pretty good and you think solar is cheaper than you thought it was originally, um, and you're thinking about your own roof and if it's ideal for solar, uh, we can go through some of those uh, things that you should be considering. So first, the solar window is 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And a solar window means um, the most important time for you to get the most amount of sun as possible. So um, if you do have, if you have a home, you have a roof and you get shading kind of closer to 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., that's not as big of a deal because it's outside of the solar window versus if you're getting um, shading at noon, you don't, you want to avoid that because that's the most important time to be getting sun. Uh, south facing roofs are the most ideal. And east and west are still good, but they often require around 10 to 20% more panels to produce the same amount of electricity as a south facing roof would have. Um, and then some other considerations are just want to answer some questions that people usually have. When you do have um, panels, people wonder, you know, if, you, if it snows, will they still produce electricity? And the answer, if the entire roof is covered, then no, they will not produce electricity. But if um, a corner of it is exposed, that small part will start to uh, produce electricity, which should help to heat the rest of the panels up a bit and melt that snow. Um, and snow typically, you know, you just need a sunny day and that snow should melt right off. Um, hail uh, panels are rated for one inch hail going 50 miles per hour. So they're pretty, the glass is pretty strong and that's because the silicon underneath there that panels are made of, it's pretty, or pretty fragile. So they need to have a very strong glass covering. And then lastly is wind loading. Um, and this is also something you don't really need to worry about because panels are only about three inches off the surface of your roof. They're pretty flush to the roof. So that shouldn't be an issue. Um, in terms of roof condition, if you are around five to eight years out from needing a new roof, you may want to consider that because if you do get panels and then you need to replace your roof five years later, um, it's a pretty annoying cost because you need to take the panels down, replace the roof, and then put the panels back up, um, which can cost a chunk of change that is definitely avoidable if you uh, get your roof replaced before going solar. And lastly, a lot of people worry about squirrels. Um, if you have a lot of squirrels or critters in your neighborhood, they can kind of get under those panels and get at the electrical work. Um, 
So we just recommend there's something called a critter guard that you could talk to an installer about. And that is a black plastic um, rim that can go around the panels that will keep critters out. Um, so now I wanted to talk about leasing versus owning. So um, I don't know if any of you have ever gotten ads or people knocking at your door offering free solar panels. Um, obviously, most things in life are not free, so they're usually talking about a lease or a power purchase agreement, not just free panels. Um, so I'm going to explain the difference. So for owning your panels, this is when you're taking care of all, taking care of all of those upfront costs, and when you have ownership of your panels, you are also um, able to get the federal incentive, the state incentive, uh, get that electricity into your home and get utility net metering. Um, so now I'll explain what a power purchase agreement and a lease are. So with the lease, this is when an installer will put panels on your home, but the installer will remain the owner of those panels and you're simply leasing them from that installer. So you'll get the electricity into your home and net metering, but the installer will get the federal and state incentives. Um, and you then also have to pay a lease or a monthly fee back to that installer for having those panels on your home. And with the lease, it's a fixed monthly fee. And with the power purchase agreement, it is a price per kilowatt hour. And these can seem nice because you're avoiding those hefty upfront costs that solar can usually come with. Um, but a lot of times the contracts are not ideal and people end up saving a lot less money than they would have if they would have just purchased panels in the first place. Uh, one big reason for this is that companies are allowed to include a cost escalator, which is typically around I think the max that they're allowed to do is 2.9%. This means that the price you pay can increase every year. So a lot of people are paying 50% more at the end of their 20 year lease than they were at the beginning. There can also be some things in your contract that are not ideal when thinking about having to move and transfer that lease or that contract to somebody else. So at Cub, we really recommend that you uh, fully look into ownership options before signing a lease or PPA contract. And we just really recommend you read that contract thoroughly so that you're not getting a bad deal. Um, you can always call Cub or send us an email if you want somebody to look over that contract for you just to make sure that everything looks all right. All right, so then, um, just one last thing with rooftop solar. Uh, when you are looking into going solar, we recommend that you compare around three to four offers from different installers just to make sure that you are getting the best deal. So the Illinois Solar Energy Association has a residential installers directory. Um, so you can type in your zip code and a mileage range and see which what installers are near you. From there, it, it is also good to get some, or to do some research on those installers. So checking the Better Business Bureau, um, Illinois Shines also has a complaint database that you can look at. Um, so big spreadsheets and you can see which installers have gotten complaints and what they got complaints about, which can be pretty helpful just so that you're not getting the worst installer there is because of course they're still companies. So they're still kind of watching out for themselves. So you also need to watch out for yourself. Um, two things to note, um, or I guess it, when you are looking at installers, another thing you want to mention um, and ask is, do they know about Illinois Shines? Do they know about that state solar incentive? Because that incentive is covering 40 to 45% of your project. So you want to make sure that your installer is up to date on all of that because they're the ones that are most likely going to be applying to that incentive for you. So just some good questions to ask. Um, through Illinois Shines, you should also be receiving a program brochure and a standard disclosure form from your installer. And if you don't, that is a violation of Illinois Shines and you can um, submit a complaint to the consumer complaint database or just call Cub and we can figure that out for you because we want to make sure as the solar industry grows that the solar companies are being kept in line and that good consumer protection practices are happening. 
um, just so that, because it is a big investment, we want to make sure that people are getting the best deal as possible. So that was a bit of a rant, but CUB is a consumer protections organization at its core. So that's definitely a big consideration when thinking about solar. Um, and then lastly, before we move on to another category, I do like to talk about energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is very important when thinking about going solar. Um, there's no point in getting a huge solar system to power a very inefficient house. It's better to get your home as efficient as possible so that you can save money and go with the smaller system as well. The other coaches uh, um, losing seasons. Uh, I think I've, someone's mic might be on. So if everyone can make sure they're muted. There's some. Thank you. Um, yeah, so energy efficiency is very important. Some of the things we recommend are making sure that your light bulbs are all LEDs, um, looking into Energy Star appliances if that's possible for you. Also making sure that your home is proper, properly weatherized. Um, one good tool, if you are a ComEd customer, we like to uh, recommend going to comed.com slash ways to save, just to make sure that you're taking advantage of all of these programs as a customer. Um, so they have um, discounts and rebates on Energy Star appliances and different services as well, like if you need to get your HVAC system tuned up or um, things along that, those lines. Um, they also have something called a home energy assessment. And this is when they'll send someone, you can sign up uh, via phone or internet and they'll send someone out to your home or do a virtual consultation. And this ComEd representative will um, make suggestions on ways that you can become more energy efficient or things that you should tweak and change. Um, they will also replace all of those, all of your light bulbs with LEDs for free if you want. Um, they can also provide low flow faucets for free and some other energy efficiency tools. Um, there are also some things offered at a discount like smart thermostats and smart uh, power strips if that's something you're interested in. So yeah, energy efficiency first always. Another thing to mention, if you are interested in going solar and you're thinking of maybe getting, um, upgrading your appliances in the next few years um, or doing something that will drastically decrease your usage, or maybe you're thinking of getting an electric vehicle in the next few years, which is something that will um, increase your usage. You can always let that installer know that you're planning on making those changes and they can take that into consideration when sizing your system so that you're, you have a system that will fit your needs for years to come and you don't need to get two more solar panels um, two years later or something like that. All right, so that was rooftop solar um, and maybe you are interested in getting solar, but you are a renter or you live in a condo, which makes um, getting solar a bit more complicated. Um, maybe you have a shaded roof or you just don't want to dive into those upfront costs and financing and everything. Uh, community solar is another great program. Um, that was once again, also created back in 2016 with FIJA our Future Energy Jobs Act and expanded in 2021 with the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. So essentially how community solar works is it is a program that allows you to subscribe to a community solar project or solar farm that is built anywhere um, in your utility territory. So here we have um, just a map of ComEd, Ameren and Mid-American. Um, so as long as the community solar project falls within your territory, it could be a hundred miles away, um, it will, you'll still um, be allowed to subscribe to it. One thing to note is if you are in a municipal utility or a co-op, um, then you most likely cannot sign up for community solar because those utilities do not have solar projects in their um, in their territory. Now, if they were to get solar projects in your territory, then by all means, you could subscribe to them. Um, but that is something to note. Um, so how does this work? Basically, when you apply to join a community solar farm, uh, you will share a copy of one of your bills 
that will show kind of your past 12 months of average usage so that the company can accurately size your subscription to cover your average monthly usage. Um, so then you're set up, you're subscribed, and each month your subscription or your portion of that solar farm is going to produce electricity. And the community solar company will then um, report that amount of kilowatt hours back to your utility and you will receive a credit for that amount on your um, electric bill. So here's kind of an example of that. In, um, the yellow, we have um, an electric bill where in this example, this person used 800 kilowatt hours, which resulted um, originally, it would have been a $109 bill, but since they joined Community Solar, they got uh, their subscription produced 714 kilowatt hours, which resulted in a $50 credit on their bill. So with Community Solar, their electric bill ends up being $59 versus before it was 109. But you still um, then have to pay a subscription fee back to the Community Solar provider. So this fee covers maintenance and helps to fund the program. Um, but right now there are around eight community solar companies and out of trying to be competitive, they are all currently offering a discount. So instead of paying back the full amount of credits you received, you pay back at a discounted rate. So some are 20% off, some are 10% off. Um, community solar then results in definitely a smaller amount of savings, um, but it is savings each month. And I would say the program is more geared for you know, people who are looking to offset their carbon usage and support the um, support new uh, renewable energy production in the state of Illinois. Um, but then on top of that, you get uh, a bit of savings. So it's kind of nice. Um, and um, it's kind of how it works too. I think people get concerned that they're going to be paying more than they're saving through this program. But essentially when your subscription produces electricity, um, you, you'll get a credit, you know, and you will always be paying a subscription fee that is worth less than that credit. So whether or not your subscription produces 500 kilowatt hours or 50 kilowatt hours that month, you will still always be um, paying for less. One thing to note is you want to make sure that your subscription size is accurately sized to your usage. Um, I had an interesting case this past week where someone was signed up for Community Solar, and I'm not quite sure why, but their subscription size was, around, was producing around 900 kilowatt hours each month, and they were only using around 300 kilowatt hours each month. So this was resulting in a huge credit on their bill that made their bill go negative, and then they had to pay back 90% of that to the solar company. We discovered that the reason that was happening is because the, those credits were actually accumulating, so they were paying for the credits as they were accumulated and not as they were applied. Um, but that is something to keep in mind, you know, if you are signing a community solar com uh, contract and they're in the contract, it says your subscription will produce an average of 10,000 kilowatt hours a year. And then you go back to your bills and you're like, oh, I only use 5,000 kilowatt hours a year. That's definitely an issue. Um, and you need to go back and get that contract amended. So we, I just like to mention that. Um, once again, as consumers, we definitely need to stick up to ourselves. And once again, if you are interested in community solar, you can also always reach out to Cub and we can take a look. Uh, at that as well. This is kind of what it looks like on your bill um, when you do get community solar. Um, they will add a section called renewable community supply details. So just to reiterate, when you do have community solar, you know, it's not panels on your roof. You're subscribing to a farm somewhere in your electric utility. Um, but they will always tell you what the project is called. So you see the project name. So if you wanted to, you could Google it and go drive out to your project and see it with your own eyes and make sure that it exists. There's also a phone number if you do need to, you know, contact the company for whatever reason. And then it will also show um, the generation and the credit. 
And then um, they'll typically be applied to your supply section first. Um, so that's kind of what that looks like. Uh, so now I just wanted to make a bit of a distinction between community solar and green plans. So I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a green plan or an alternative supplier green plan. This is usually they're knocking on your door, giving you calls, um, sending you things in the mail, um, saying like, hey, do you want to offset your carbon usage with green energy? Sign up to the special plan and just for an extra fee, we can get you um, clean energy or you can power you off of clean energy. So I would argue that green plans are much worse than community solar or rather community solar is much better than a green plan. And so I'm going to give you a few reasons why. So first of all, green plans um, are, they usually don't have, you know, they don't own a physical farm or wind farm. Um, they're typically purchasing renewable energy credits from an offsite location. And the issue with this is a lot of times, a lot of times these renewable energy credits or RECs are coming from like older wind farms that are out of state. Um, there are a lot in Texas that sell RECs up uh, to places up here in the Midwest and across the country. And because they're purchasing them from these old uh, wind farms or old projects, um, by being part of this plan, you're not really helping to encourage the production of new renewable electricity, which is kind of what we want if we want to start seeing a transition away from fossil fuels and onto renewable energy. Um, you know, these wind farms are built, they don't need constant um, funding as well. Like, they're just making money at this point. So it's better to try to use your dollar towards supporting new production of renewables instead. Um, so that's my first point. The second point, community solar, well, I guess, yeah, so community solar, all of those projects are required to be brand new projects in the state of Illinois. So it is nice that you are, you know that you're supporting production in your own state as well. And just the fact that you can go out and see the project yourself is pretty reassuring that it actually exists and that you're not just being charged by some broker. Um, you know that you're uh, helping to offset your usage with renewable energy. The third big point is that community solar does save you money, although those savings are usually pretty small each month, you know, they add up over time and uh, it is nice to see a saving on your bill, especially with such um, insanely high electric prices versus green plans, they often overcharge you. So, you know, ComEd right now is charging around 11 cents per kilowatt hour. A green plan might say, you know, get green energy for 14 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so they're overcharging you for really no reason versus community solar, you can actually get some savings. And then community solar plans are overall just more transparent than green plans are. Um, they're also through the Illinois Shines like state program. So they have higher consumer protections built in. So that's kind of my argument of community solar versus green plans. Uh, here are some things to consider when picking a community solar provider. So first, um, yeah, as I said before, I believe there are around eight community solar companies in the state of Illinois. Some offer 10% savings on those credits. Uh, some offer 20% savings. So you can decide which one you would rather sign up for there. Uh, all of them also have differing contract terms. Um, so if you like the idea of being locked into something for the next 15 years and you know you're going to get savings, then maybe that's the um, plan for you. If you don't like that, you can avoid it as well. That being said, none of the current programs have an exit fee. So as long as you give them 90 days notice, uh, you can exit the program without paying a fee to break that contract. Um, also, some of them require a credit check or a soft credit check. Others don't. So you can choose which is best for you based on that. And um, how will the company bill you? So as it's set up, most companies will send you or you'll get your ComEd bill with the credits applied. So you'll pay a lower ComEd bill and then you will receive an additional bill from your community solar company to pay that subscription fee. Some companies also offer consolidated billing where they will pay your ComEd bill for you and then you'll just pay that subscription fee back to them. Um, and your ComEd bill, it's consolidated, so they take care of the ComEd. Um, 
or some companies also have auto pay or maybe even require auto pay. So you can decide, you know, which, which uh, plan works best for you. Um, Cub has a pretty great website called solarinthecommunity.com. If this does interest you in any way, um, on that website, we have kind of the same information I've just been talking about for the past 15 minutes. We also have all of the current deals uh, listed with links to the websites. And we have this comparison chart that lists the offers side by side. So here you can look at all of them at once, see which utility territories are being offered in, the savings, contract terms, and um, what kind of billing they have. And then we also have their contact information. One interesting thing I wanted to bring up just because I thought it could offer some, some discussion potentially is community-driven community solar. So I've mentioned this way back in the beginning, but with the passage of the Climate and, or, yeah, Climate and Equitable Jobs Act in 2021, um, there was an additional category added to the Illinois Shines program called community-driven community solar. So essentially how this is differentiated from normal community solar is the renewable energy credit prices are higher than regular community solar. So by starting one of these projects, you would be incentivized more than a regular community solar project. And the reason this was added into CJA um, was to encourage um, kind of more diversity in the production of community solar projects. And what I mean by that is right now, most uh, community solar farms are these large, like five megawatt projects that are in Illinois farmland somewhere far away. Um, they're not really benefiting the community directly. So they're not really creating jobs because they are far off with um, not, not using local. Um, workers to put those together. So the idea of having community driven community solar would hopefully be to create something in the community that can benefit people in multiple ways. So, you know, community empowerment, having this shared source of electricity. Um, I think a lot of people value the idea of that. Also job creation, putting these um, panels up and installing them. Also educational opportunities. I think it's really impactful if you do live in, in your community and you have a solar farm somewhere that if you know that you're getting your power from that solar farm and you can walk by it every day, um, I think that does something to help educate people on renewable energy and just climate change in general and it gets it onto the forefront of people's minds. Um, and just to increase like participation in decisions. So um, it really just helps to involve communities more, which is why um, it's incentivized more. We want to see more of these community driven community solar projects in Illinois. So some fun things to think about are what could indirect impacts look like because we know what the direct impacts are. All right, and then the last thing I will be talking about tonight is a program called Illinois Solar for All. So this is the other in solar incentive program run through the state. Um, Illinois Shines is the non-income um, eligible program, and then Illinois Solar for All is the income eligible program. So through Illinois Solar for All, people are able to access rooftop solar and community solar. Um, and there's also a subcategory for nonprofit and public facilities. And if you qualify, this is basically the best way that you can get solar. So the income qualification is you must be at or below 80% area median income. Um, this changes based on location in the state and household size. So you can go to illinoissfa.com to learn more about this. Um, and essentially how it works, um, written into law, there are just greater consumer protections and greater guaranteed savings. So any ongoing costs or fees that are associated with being part of an Illinois Solar for All program cannot exceed 50% of the value of the energy produced. So um, I'll explain that. Kind of a different way. So if you're in a community solar um, program that is a solar for all community solar program, 
um, when you receive those credit, credits on your bill, you will only have to pay 50% of that back um, as your subscription fee versus an Illinois Shines program, you'd have to pay either 80 or 90% back. So that's already a major saving for community solar. And then to blow everyone's mind, you can kind of get solar panels for free through Solar for All if you do uh, qualify um, with the, or if you are eligible through your income. So when you get rooftop solar through Solar for All, it will be set up as kind of a lease. So um, you'll get panels installed, you'll be able to use that electricity and um, participate in net metering. Um, but uh, as a normal lease, there are no upfront costs, but additionally, you don't pay anything month to month. Um, so essentially you're getting panels for free. You're not the owner of the panels, but you don't really need to be because you're not paying anything anyways. Um, so it's really, really great program and the funds are kind of underutilized just because it's hard to convince people to go solar if you're you know, struggling with paying with other things in your life, um, but this makes it easy. And it was specifically developed to make sure that certain communities aren't being left behind as people are um, transitioning to solar and getting um, these savings on their electric bills. So that is solar for all, um, kind of how to access it. So if you want to find an approved vendor, this is kind of an improved installer. You can go to the IllinoisSFA.com website and go to their vendor directory. Um, there you can put, you can, there's some filters you can put in like your county and other things you may be looking for to find the right installer for you. Um, and then community solar, uh, those offers, I believe there's only one right now. Um, anyways, with open spots, you can sign up for that as well on the website. And just to show if you are on the website and you go to the Illinois residents section and scroll down a bit, it will make it pretty easy for you to figure out what options you have. So as a renter, you can really only apply for uh, community solar, but if you're a homeowner, you can decide what's best for you if you want to do community solar or rooftop solar. And then uh, they do, again, have that uh, subcategory for nonprofit organizations and public facilities. And that actually, I kind of blew through my presentation there, but typically I get a lot of questions on uh, solar related items. So uh, hopefully we'll have plenty of time to chat about everything, but yeah, that is all I have. Just left on the screen is my email and uh, CUPS hotline and website. If you do have any more questions, um, you can either reach out to me or go to our website or call our hotline. Yeah, that is all I have in terms of the presentation. Thank you. Would you mind putting your email and uh, the CUB website in the chat, if you don't mind, so that uh, everybody can access it later on? Yeah, I can do that. All right. Now we're going to take uh, questions for Mar Mar Mariana. Now, are you involved personally in community solar or any of the projects described in CUB? So I'm waiting. I just moved into a new apartment and I want to get my average electricity usage. So once that happens, um, I do plan on signing up for a community solar offer. That does remind me, and I usually mention this um, and forgot um, to do so. There are extremely long wait lists for community solar right now, at least the 20% saving programs um, around six to nine months on average. So people are kind of signing up for a wait list. And then once these, these pro projects are currently being built. So once they are, then they'll connect you to a project. So when you are on the wait list, it doesn't really change anything for you. Um, and then some of the 10% ones don't have as long a wait list and that's because they don't have as good of a deal. So people are, um, I think, just trying to wait a bit longer for that 20% uh, instead. Okay, Jake, is that you uh, on the phone there? Like, yeah, um, I Hi, I'm on the phone. I can't see the chat. Could you? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. Could you tell us or your your name and contact information again? Yep. So my name is Marina Minnick. I'm the Solar Programs Administrator at Cub, and my Did email. Say again, Marian, Marian what? Marina M A R I N A. 
like a uh, marina uh, for boats. Uh, I, oh, a marina, okay. Yeah. yeah what, what's your <laughs> last name? Minic, M-I-N-I-C. I see, okay. So my email yeah. then is mminick at mm. citizensutilityboard.org. Wait, Minic spelled out. Yeah, the whole thing, Citizens Utility Board spelled out? Yep. Citizens Utility Board. Dot what? Dot com? Dot org. Dot org. Okay, thank you. And yep. is there a phone number there or no? Yeah, let me look up again. Yeah, it's not on there. Um, so our hotline number, yeah. which is pretty helpful, um, and you can always ask for me and get transferred, um, is 1-800-669-5556. Okay. Now... The Citizens Utility Board was established in the early 1970s, is that right? Uh, 1983. Oh, okay. And what was the original charter? Um, what was the original intent? So we were charged with advocating for utility rate pairs across the state of Illinois. So okay. that um, mainly involves consumer protections. Okay, okay. And is it is it is the agency funded by the state or is it funded by by subscribers or both? Um, not by the state. So we're uh, funded by different grants and members. Okay. Okay. All right. And 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 lastly, the this whole this whole deal, the what was called the Energy Jobs Act, is that what it's called? Clean yeah, Energy the- Jobs Act that went through the state. Um, they included a seven hundred fifty million dollar bailout for Commonwealth Edison. Did 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 did, did Cub oppose that? In any, which 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 translates into a big rate increase for for uh, rate payers. Did did, did uh, Cub oppose that in any way? Is that the carbon mitigation plan with the nuclear? Well, that was part. That was I. My I don't know. I don't know specifically. I mean, it may be two different bills. I'm not sure. But that was that was part of the that was part of the clean energy plan. Was my understanding. In 2021. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I can answer that. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. So, because I believe that was part of the same deal. That it was there. There. There were two two nuclear power plants that were bailed out. Uh, by the state to the tune of seven hundred fifty million dollars, which which translates into a, a big uh, rate increase for uh, for ComEd customers. But I think it was part of the that. same bill. It may have been it may have been a separate bill. I'm not certain. Yeah, I know there was a carbon mitigation plan as part of CJA, where if rates did increase to a certain Point, it would actually result in a credit for ComEd customers. So the rates did increase to a certain point. And if you have noticed on your ComEd bills, under, I believe, taxes and fees section, there should be a uh, carbon-free climate mitigation credit there. Um, but that might be different. Uh, full disclaimer, I started working at Cub in February, and I wasn't a part of uh, kind of the passage of siege. I've been learning as much as I can about it, so there might oh, be some. So can, so yeah, came, more specific. I wasn't part of the fight. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, Kerry, you got the next question. Go ahead. Um, do I, I do I misunderstand? But when you know, like, like many years ago, like ten years ago, more than ten years ago, we were all given the choice of selecting who we would get our electricity from. And some of these were green suppliers, and I didn't think I think they were actually producers. So when I when I picked Joe's 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 solar company, he actually had a solar farm somewhere, and the more people signed up for them, they had they installed more solar panels. So it's not just buying those green credits like you were talking about. So isn't that? <clears throat> my recollection is when I first signed up with them, I signed up with with one solar farm. I think it is in Texas, but it was a few cents more per kilowatt hour than the other other suppliers. 
But then a few years later, it was less. Actually, less than the, some of the, most of the other suppliers. And I haven't been following that since then. Um, but you didn't seem to mention this. This is is it a scam or did, did, did it, you just fail to fail to list the choice of buying electricity from a green supplier? Um, it is completely possible that I overgeneralized with alternative supplier green plans for sure. Um, but I would say any time they're charging you more, we just typically recommend that you stay away from that. Not but much. it's definitely true that alternative suppliers sometimes do charge a better rate. Um, but like I said, when I signed up for, I mean, there was, but this was this was back when you could not buy panels for your roof. Okay, mm -hmm. you had no choice. You, there were no community solar, there were no panels for your roof. You had no, you, you, the only thing you could do is buy it from a coal-fired plant or buy it from a solar farm or buy it from a wind farm. I couldn't find any wind farms actually. Um, and, and like I said, I think it was like you know, one or two cents more per kilowatt hour. But when I said a few years later, it was actually less than most of the other things because yeah. it's really getting cheaper. And that, that, that does make sense. And I have not checked recently. So, um, okay, so I was just yeah. curious about that because you didn't really, because you made it sound like they were all swim, con games. They weren't, they didn't actually have solar farm. But I, I was on the impression, you know, the more people signed up, the more, the more solar panels they had to install because they were actually supplying the energy. Yeah, I think it depends on how they procure procure their energy. Um, but once again, if you, I mean, doing that when you were able to get solar through any other way, if you are okay with paying more, then that's like well, I wouldn't I want to discourage you against that either. I, I checked. I checked a few years later, and it was and it was less at that at that point. It was less. Yeah. And I have not checked in the last five years, so I don't know. You know, maybe maybe it's more again. I don't know, but. My, my 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 bills are not that big because I I have gas heat, and I don't, and I only run air window air conditioning in a few rooms, so I don't really, um you know back when I was married, and, and the, the wife ran the air conditioner, cooled the whole you know whole whole house air conditioning, cooled the whole house down real cold. We did have some big bills in the summertime, but that has not been the case since since the divorce. Mm -hmm. Um, the other question is, are there are there, um installers that you, you will, will do lease to own. So I lease, lease it for 10 years, 15 years, and at, at, at the end of that, it becomes mine. So I'm paying a higher lease rate, but eventually, you know, so I'm not, but I'm not paying an upfront charge because I don't, I don't get the tax, I mean, I don't have enough income to get the, a taxable income to get, to get the tax credits from the federal tax credits. So either, you know, so I, but I would like to own it eventually. Yeah, I think um, most, uh, solar installers that offer a lease also offer, or like would offer lease to own. But not all solar installers offer leasing, so that's just something you'd have to check into. Some of them only offer um, installing for you to purchase. Okay, and can I, um, and can can I install a, a minimal system now when I'm when I'm not doing that much? Um, Using that much electricity, but with, with the intent that I would I would convert to a heat pump at some later point, in which case I would need to upgrade the system. You know, have it already built, and I'll just plugging in more panels without you know have the maybe even having the mounting strips already installed on the roof. So somebody just come in and plug in the panels, plug in more. If I, I want a battery system, so I would just plug in more bat. And I, I recommend really just plug in more. You know, you know every month go out and buy another battery and stick it into the system. You know, so I can avoid the upfront cost right now, but I can upgrade over time. Anybody do that? I've, yeah, I talked to someone, I think a couple weeks ago who got half of their panels and then five years later got the other half just due to financing reasons. They thought that that would be the best uh, way for them. And they were able to get the uh, state incentives both times. But I've heard other cases when their uh, application didn't go through, like they weren't able to get that state incentive twice. So I don't feel comfortable saying either way um, what would happen. I think it's a case by case basis, or I'm not sure how those two cases differed, but it's definitely possible, especially if you have the same, if you're getting the same panels to get some of them at one point and then a couple of years later add more. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, let's go to our next question. Richard, you're up next. Unmute, Richard. Thank Richard. you very much. Uh, thanks so much indeed, Marina. It's very exciting, very interesting stuff. I've been through all generations of this stuff. I started off with uh, 
uh, one of the rip-off companies called Clean Choice. It was a, a, rip, a, rec, a Rex only. They didn't sell it that way when they, uh, it sounded like they had their own generators when they sold it, but it was that 10 cent per kilowatt hour versus that six or so that, that uh, Commonwealth Edison had at the time. So we dumped that one. Uh, I then got my own solar cells on the roof and uh, uh, I don't have a very large roof, so I can only get 12 panels, which isn't enough to meet my uh, supply, my needs by a long way. So um, I then got uh, community solar from um, Clearway, so one ones you have on the system. And that's been very good. I, I started this in July last year, and I got a couple of zero bills in October and uh, yeah, October, November last year. And I've had a series of zero bills this year where the credits have been uh, very high, but I still got large charges in the middle of the summer when I was running a lot of air conditioning. But I think net, net is pretty good. But I noticed that the charge from the community solar, from the solar supplier goes up and down every month. I would have thought it was, I was buying a certain set of solar cells basically and that I would get a flat charge. It doesn't seem to work that way. It's double some months when it is in other months. Why is that? So um, community solar is kind of structured as a power purchase agreement, which means you're charged uh, per kilowatt hour. So it depends on how much, how, how much electricity those panels are producing each month. So it might just be that one month was very rainy and then the next month we had more sun. Very good. Just one, one uh, comment about um, uh, uh, buying the solar cells in, in batches. The technology is changing very rapidly. Uh, when I got mine, they were 240 uh, watts per panel. Now it would be 360 watts for a panel, I think, or something like that. And if you want to upgrade, every piece of what you have basically gets thrown out. The racks even don't work anymore. All the wiring has to come down. The um, converters, the, uh, um, what do you call them? The, uh, uh, yeah, they don't work anymore. So it's, uh, uh, it, it's hard to um, keep up to date with these things and they are changing. The new ones are a lot better than the old ones. So thank you. Okay, Charlie, you're up next. Charlie, you're up next. Yes, uh, Marina, this may not be your area of expertise. I could understand, but every now and then I get these robocalls telling me to get rid of Commonwealth Edison. And they sound like people from, they're not calling from the United States. Uh, what is your candid opinion of these operations. Uh, if not, if you're not your area, I can understand. Thank you. I mean, personally, I hate robocalls. Cub even has a guide on how to avoid robocalls, which to summarize it, it's essentially don't pick up your phone until they leave a voicemail and you know that they're a person that is relevant to your life and then you can give them a call back. Um, so that's a tip for avoiding them. But yeah, that's like a common marketing technique for alternative suppliers. And it's, I wouldn't say Cub is just overall completely anti-alternative supplier in every situation. We just really recommend that people proceed with caution because a lot, I, I mean, I was at a tabling event this week and a woman came in with something she got in the mail and it said, call us to switch to this um, electricity and you get a hundred dollar visa gift card. She was like, oh, sure. And she wanted me to check in to see how much the rate would be. And I call and of course it's like 14 and a half cents versus ComEd is 11. So a lot of them have um, deceiving practices. I know Clean Choice for a while was actually using the ComEd logo on their marketing materials, even though they're not ComEd. So that kind of confuses people. They're like, oh yeah, it's my utility, it's ComEd, when it's really not. So that, um, we try to keep an eye on these deceiving marketing practices. And another thing with alternative suppliers is sometimes they'll lock you in for two years, one year, and the first three months will actually be a lower rate than the price to compare or like the current rate of the utility. And then after that three months, it'll jump um, and people won't notice because they don't even know or they don't really know where that rate would be found on their bill. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but we oh, just, yeah, we just really recommend that people watch out. We, we had a program on consumer fraud 
Sure. So that's why I brought it up. And it's indicative of free market capitalism. That's part of life in a free market capitalist society. That's why we need cub. <laughs> yes. Just a matter of fact, um, that very lecture, Senior Fraud, was just, uh, I got a strike on it on my YouTube account because of some extraneous COVID content that was done during the uh, Q&A period. They just took it down now because of, um, uh, we went down a COVID rabbit hole and they were saying that I didn't have the proper vaccine information. I'm going to move that to another uh, channel and make sure this YouTube account's going crazy. I mean, sometimes this stuff can get a little bit crazy with censorship, especially with our forum. But anyway, enough said about that. Richard, I know you have a question, so go ahead, please. I mute, Richard. Once you get off one of these uh, uh, guys using Rex, they'll pester you forever. Just to click here, one button, and you'll be back on to Mars and our wonderful service. And so it's a real, real pain to get off them. Uh, so just be careful when you get involved with them. Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot of times people don't realize they're signed up for them. So during our uh, UBCs or utility bill clinics, that's a common thing we'll see is that someone signed up for an alternative supplier with a higher rate and they didn't even really realize that they were on it. So it's pretty common. What do you do in a situation like that with somebody? So luckily, um, I guess if any of you ever want to to double check to see if you're you are on an alternative supplier or not um, kind of on the front of your comrade bill with that circle that breaks down the three parts of your bill under supply it will say comed supplies your energy and if you're not on an alternative supplier it will tell you what company it is and it will also have a phone number so if you do um um, if it's a worse rate, then we'll say call that number and cancel and you're usually able to do so and it'll automatically transfer you back to ComEd um, electric supply. Um, another thing is that if you do believe that there were, there was um, fraudulent or deceiving marketing, uh, or you can work with Cub or go to the uh, Illinois Shines Complaint Center and through that portal, you can get to like the attorney general's office complaints and they specifically deal with um, deceiving marketing and fraud essentially. And you can always file a complaint um, just to let people know that this company is up to no good, I guess, or uh, have, um, that they have deceiving marketing. So we, we often help people through the complaint process as well. Okay, we have, uh... We're still got an open mic for questions. Who else has a question? Nobody else has a question. Um, Charlie, do you think we ought to get into rebuttals now? Okay, uh, K K Carrie, you got a question? Yeah, um, another presentation um, was talking about the difference between systems that are only by you know solar lease solar with cell back and systems with a battery, you didn't seem to go into the complications of that. But, uh, yeah, I can okay. go into that a bit. So kind of the three options you have when you do install panels on your home, you have the grid tied system, um, which is when you're tied to your utilities grid, and that's when you can participate in the net metering. Um, then you have a battery back system, and then you can have multi mode where you're both um, connected to the grid and have a backup battery. So all those are very possible. Um, right now, the I think I mentioned this, the new federal tax credit of 30% that now covers batteries, which makes that a bit more affordable. But I will say that batteries um, are still quite expensive. We're still working on the technology to get that cost down. Um, so for maybe if you are in an area that um, experiences power outages a lot, maybe a battery is worth investing because if you are simply a grid tied system and there's a power outage, your panels will also go out or your power will go out. And that's because you don't want to be sending live power onto the grid when there are um, linesmen trying to repair it. Uh, so for safety and code reasons, they have to shut down. But if you have a backup battery with the transfer switch, then your home can continue to be powered uh, with that stored energy. 
So once again, if it's worth it, or I've talked to some people who have like uh, medical needs where they need to have constant power or a backup, then that makes sense to spend that extra money. But you know, sometimes adding in the battery can double right there, easily double the price of your uh, project cost, which a lot of everyday people can't really afford to do. Okay, uh, Jake, you're next. Okay, I got a question. Um, a few years back, there, I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but a few years back, there was uh, uh, the issue came up of the uh, franchise agreement between City of Chicago and Commonwealth Edison. A few years later, uh, it, it, the same process took place in Evanston and some of the suburbs. Uh, my question is, did Cub... Uh, did come, and, and I think it's coming up again sometime next year, though I'm not certain. Um, it, did did Cub uh, play a role in dealing with with the uh, uh, negotiations on that? Do you know, and and to what end? Um, sorry, I don't think I can answer that either. Can't answer that. Okay. All right. Um, and one other question. Um, does Cub get involved with um, uh, uh, the, uh, the water department? The city is considered a utility. Does Cub get involved in dealing with water rates at all? Yeah, so that is something we've been getting into, both water rates and um, the privatization of water. There are a lot of um, there's a lot of that going on right now in the state of Illinois, specifically, is uh, water being privatized. And then as far as rates. Um, Yes, yeah, so I know we are advocating that you get a meter um, because that we've seen can reduce your water bills by having a meter um, rather than um, unmetered rates. And this is not my area of expertise, but we do have someone on staff who's very interested in um, water, municipal water and everything. So um, if you do have any questions, we can definitely give the hotline a call. But yeah, oh, definitely who's something we're... Yeah, who's the who's the water person? Um, Joe Jambardino. And I Joe think I mean our law Jamber team is also Jambardino. Yeah, Joe Jambardino and also uh, his first name is Brian, and I should know his last name. There are a couple people on our team who are working on that. Brian is our policy um, guy and He's working more on the privatization side of things versus Joe is working kind of on that utility bill level. Do you know how to reach them or just call the same number and ask for them? Yeah, you can call and ask okay. for them. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, opposed, I'm opposed to the privatization of water, but the, the city of Chicago water department is just very corrupt in terms of their billing practices, in terms of how they, the, their whole operation. Yeah, and I know with the billing practices, you'd have to reach out to the Department of Finance and not the Water Department, because um, they're oh. the ones that deal with billing. I've heard this many times because I know a few of the people from the, the finance the finance department. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, okay uh, Charlie. All right. Thanks, Jake. Charlie, you got the next yeah. question. Go ahead. Yeah, Marina. If I don't know if it's possible to answer this, but you had, per the Illinois Solar for All, let's say I had an average bungalow in Chicago, and I'm a retired senior citizen, so I make the poverty level criteria. What would it cost to put a solar installation in? And I realize this is just generalizations, but what would it cost the homeowner uh, under that program? For, so for Solar for All, the income qualified program, if you do qualify, you'd essentially get panels for free. How that works is they set it up as a lease to own. Um, the lease period, I believe, is 20 years. Um, and there's zero upfront costs and zero monthly payments. And then for some reason, after 20 years, they sell you the panels for $1, I think is how they set it up. Um, just That's so a good deal. Yeah, some type of financial tra transaction. So if you qualify for Solar for All, you essentially get panels for free. Okay, sign me up. Huh. Yeah, I, I'll actually, um, let me send that um, link in the chat. Okay. 
All right, again, uh, we're at the same stage where, Mar Mar uh, Margaret, I noticed you had a question. Do you still want to ask it? Okay. And we're still open for more questions. If you guys uh, are done, we can move into the yeah, bottom. I, I, maybe she knows this, Tim. Okay. How does the supplying of energy by nuclear compare in costs by any with solar? I don't think I can answer that. Um, I think Cub's official standpoint on nuclear, since people tend to be interested in that, is that it should be the last source of power essentially to be shut down. Yeah. Um, because it is better, of course, than um, the other options. Uh, but I think an ideal world would consist of fully renewable and clean energy. So last thing to be shut down before we get there. Also, I'm going to go grab my charger, but I'm still here. Okay, Mariana. Um, anybody else have any more? Okay, Jake, you got another one. Go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yes. This is just an, this this is my answer to Charlie's question. Um, ever ever since we've had nuclear power plants in the state, the cost of electricity has gone up and up and up. Because the the, the com, ComEd keeps going back, ComEd keeps going back to the Illinois Commerce Commission and within the last couple of years to the legislature to ask for a rate increase and, and likewise to the legislature to ask for a big bailout. So it's costing us more and more money. And I think you can I think you can trace that through the through the figures if you research it out. I don't know where to find it exactly, but you can it's 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 on the record. Okay. So uh, nuclear nuclear electricity is very expensive. Yeah. Nuclear power is the most expensive way ever ever invented to boil water. Thank you. Well, I think <laughs> we can go down this. Uh, I support nuclear power myself, but uh, we, like I said, we can go down this rabbit hole a little later on today. Any other questions for uh, Mariana at this point? Um, I got one more, Mariana. If you. Um, just a little bit more background about yourself. I know you told us a little earlier before everybody joined us. Uh, how did you come to Cub, and what do you? How do you like working there? Yeah, I can give a bit of a more more of a full a full answer than I did before. But um, I graduated from UW Madison with a degree in chemistry and environmental studies. And after that, I went on. I worked at a winery in their lab for a few months. Um, and after that, I kind of missed the environmental work that I did back in college. I was part of an organization called um, Campus Leaders for Energy Action Now, where we were trying to get UW-Madison to commit to converting or transitioning to renewable um, electricity. So I just, I was searching for jobs for a while and came across CUB. I really like the consumer protections aspect of it, um, but then I'm also specifically the solar programs administrator so I get to do a bit more in the clean energy field which I've always been interested in um, and it's an outreach position so I really love talking to people about all these issues um, getting into you know a debate and everything um, I find it fun and a lot of people are just not aware of the current situation with solar and the incentives available to them so it's nice to kind of get people um, informed on what's going on. And uh, do you do a lot of, what is your percentage of public speaking on your job? Or do you do that a lot? Or is it just more outreach via Zoom? Probably, I mean, close to 50%, I would say. I feel like I have an event, like a few events a week at least. So um, uh, we're running like a group buy program, which I probably should have mentioned in that presentation, um, where Cub is partnering up with um, an educational organization called the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. And they want they run group buy programs all across the Midwest for solar. So um, they chose us as their local contact in Chicagoland area, and we're running a group buy. It's kind of when we put out an RFP for um, installers and competitively selected one. 
and I think I have done about 40 presentations about that program since it started in June. So a lot of my time so far has been focused on that. Okay. Um, brief recommendation. You ever heard of a group called Toastmasters? Mm -hmm. It's a public speaking organization. Go to Toastmasters.org. What does that have to do with anything? Charlie, I just made a recommendation to her, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Just take a look at it. I've been a member. It has nothing to do with the topic. Charlie, we're going to get to your question. Now we can either, uh, I'm going to mute you temporarily while I finish this comment. Um, it, it, Marina, I'm just, it's something that's helped me out in public speaking awareness, and I'm just going to bring it to you, toastmasters.org. I'll leave it at that, okay? All right, Charlie, unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, Charlie, you're up. Yeah, I, I actually have a question. Well, good. I actually have a question about the topic. Um, I'm not certain if you're familiar with this as well, but I believe certain municipalities supply electricity as a, as a part of municipal service, such as Cleveland, Ohio, I believe has done so. Wouldn't it be better to simply clear matters out uh, since they have state-run state -run programs and make uh, Commonwealth Edison an agency of the uh, region, uh, municipal services, such as the Water Reclamation District operates? Yeah, so I guess in Illinois, I don't know if this is what you're referring to, but in Illinois, there are certain municipalities that have municipal utilities for their gas and electric, and then there are also regions that have uh, cooperative electric utilities. Is that kind of what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah, make it a, a government operation. Yeah. I would say that's an interesting um, point. I know right now, um, as things are, so investor owned utilities are under um, stricter regulation than others, but so something I've seen with municipal utilities is that their net metering policy and some other solar related policy isn't as good maybe as ComEd's is, um, for example, you know, not to, not that I'm in love with ComEd or anything either, but they're just under stricter regulation. So if you are to get, if you were to get solar panels um, and you're a ComEd customer, for example, you are guaranteed that one-to-one -one rate for net metering versus in municipal utilities, they're not under that same regulation. Um, CJA, one thing CJA did was actually require municipal utilities to publish um, public net metering policy. And now that we can see that, we're seeing that sometimes net metering isn't offered at all. Other times you're getting a fraction back of what you're being charged. So I would, I think it's an interesting point as long as they're being fair and that people understand how to get involved with the boards and have some say in policies that are created. Yeah, I would say it's a good point though. It would just take a lot of work. Well, on some people board. have a right. negative view, rightly or wrongly, about Commonwealth Edison, somewhat due in part uh, to their nuclear uh, activities. That's what I mean. Okay, uh, Jake, you got the next question. Did you want to answer? Yeah, that? this is this is not a question. This is a response. We the, the we went through this several years ago when Comed. Uh, there was, uh, as I said, there was a, there was a, uh, it was a back during the, when, when Daly was mayor, uh, renewal of the Commonwealth as a franchise agreement, and there was a big push towards municipal, uh, municipal takeover, and I was on this, there was actually a referendum on the ballot at one point, a non-binding referendum, citywide, or in several, several, not citywide, but in several precincts around the city, and I was undecided at first. Uh, I finally came out opposed opposed to it simply because I don't think I don't think the city is equipped to handle it. Um, remember, this this is a city that can't even get uh, 
they can't even get parking meters right. I oh, get out of here, up. Jake. That's not a reason. <laughs> well, no, that is a reason. I'm no, saying. It's not. It's they, not. I'm, I'm saying. Well, 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 let me excuse me. Excuse me. It's my time. Let it's a question period, Jake. Sure. Let me finish. Okay. Let me finish. Okay. To stop it. Uh, excuse me. Sorry. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not convinced that the city is equipped to handle it properly with the city needs to do. Uh, let me finish, okay? And then you can have your turn, okay? What the city needs to do from its side is put up a good good energy conservation program so that we can stop wasting power. They have one. All right. Uh, they had this? one. It was defunded. It's no longer operative. It's like far, they disappointed the commissioner of energy. Oh, well, maybe it was funded back. Okay. Okay. All right. Any All right. questions, uh, Charlie and, and Jake? I know you've had plenty. I'd like to ask if anybody else does. If not, we're going to go into a rebuttal period. Mariana, what's going to happen next is that we're going to be going into a rebuttal period. Each and every will have a certain set amount of time to make remarks. And uh, uh, right now, I'll, so I'll close out the question period now. Who has a rebuttal tonight? And thank you, Mary. Go ahead and thank her, Charlie. All right, Mariana, thanks for doing a speech tonight. I appreciate you coming on board. And uh, I got to compliment you doing good with the presentation handling this crowd. So, um, all right, who's got rebuttals tonight? Charlie, do you have a rebuttal? Uh, Dan? Um, okay, Charlie, you got a rebuttal. Who else has a rebuttal? I might have. I don't know. It depends on. I mean, it may be rebutting you. <laughs> now it's time to go down the nuclear rabbit hole if we have to. All right then. Uh, I'll need a few minutes to prepare. Okay, Charlie's raised his hand. Margaret's a potential rebutter. Who else? Do you want to say anything? You're usually pretty good at this stuff. And uh, Dan, or you want to say anything or not? Okay. Um. We have some time. I'm going to give everybody eight minutes for rebutting tonight. Um, and what I'm going to do is basically, I am not opposed to solar. I'm not opposed to um, renewables per se, but my biggest argument is they are not going to produce enough power to maintain an advanced industrial society. The thing is, is that I'm reason I'm for nuclear power not so much the conventional kind where we have the conventional light water reactors, but some of the newer types of light of generation four reactors that come in, namely those that run on what we call thorium molten salt reactors. What they do is they're a lot safer than the conventional light water reactors. You could power about a, a five cities, like in the city of, of Algonquin, Lake in the Hills, about 100,000 people on a building about the size of a small uh, house. It would it would need to be shielded, of course, because of the, it is a nuclear uh, reactor, but it doesn't need to have the heavy shielding because there's not a lot of water under pressure. It uses uh, the Thor, it, it runs on a, on a liquefied molten salt where the nuclear material is actually mixed in with that salt and it runs through loops and they do the reaction inside a, a, a reactor. What is so nice about it is that uh, they also redo, remove the actinides and it produces a lot less waste. I'm not going to get into the technology too much now because you can do that by going to the Thorium Energy Alliance webpage of and it's thoriumenergyalliance.com. There's an association out in Harvard that's been doing this for years. My big, big thing is that if we're going to replace oil and we're going to replace uh, and get rid of our fossil fuel usage, you have to have a good high concentrated power alternative. And the only way that I can see that is through the development of thorium nuclear power. And Charlie, I know you think that there's been no commercial reactors made right now, but there are reactors operating now. They just opened one up in China recently. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, you're... Charlie, do you want me to get in right now and show you the website and some of the news articles behind? I just looked it up. It's not even. It's not open. It is. Look at look at it some more. 
it opened up in September of this year. And uh, it's now being operational. It's a small experimental reactor, but they, that works. They're going to go to commercialize it, and they could probably have the reactors ready for sale in less than six or seven years. And, and I think there's also several other companies out there, Thorcon's developing a molten salt reactor that can fit on, onto a barge. Um, there are several others that, are kind of fine that can be built now. And frankly, it's the only way that I can see how we knew we have full in we, we can maintain our advanced industrial society without quote unquote deep industrializing the world. The city of Chicago itself uses a lot of power and there's no way that you're going to be able to have renewables replace all that power. You're going to need, you're going to need an all of the above strategy. Yes, I like solar. Yes, I like wind, but they're very intermittent. The battery technology is not quite there yet. And I do know that solar and wind have gone down in cost quite a bit. But again, we're going to need a, a lot of power, especially now with everybody wanting their electric cars and everybody else. Uh, Corey, that was last September, by the way, not um, not this year. It was last year they got it running. Um, my own view is that uh, there are several presentations on the web. If you just Google thorium nuclear power and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It'll get into the... Uh, It'll get into the, uh, it will get, oh God, this is crazy. My light keeps going off here. Um, it will get into the uh, specifics of it. And I think you'll be able to see for yourself that uh, it is, uh, you know, are you against for or against nuclear? The next question is which kind? Are you against the light water reactor, which I kind of see where there's a lot of waste and a lot of products involved with it. But again, like France does, they do a lot of recycling of their nuclear waste materials, and it's pretty safe. Um, you really look into it. Um, I was quite shocked to find out that the myths that Charlie has about all the deaths created by it, it's actually saved a lot of lives already by cutting down on uh, the fossil fuel e emissions that would come in. And if we shut down all of our power and went to solar, and we'd be a lot like Germany, where they're now more reliant on gas and coal than ever because they don't have the because of the intermittency of renewables i honestly think that uh, you know the solar and wind is a good idea but it is a widespread um widely dispersed source of power good for the homeowner good for the little business but if you're going to need a lot of power and do in a city or a downtown and maintain the electric cars and the grid there's a lot that has to be said when you enter when you interlock um solar and wind inside an electric grid because a lot of times what they do is because it is intermittent power they have to regulate it to cycle um hertz and uh it does take a lot of uh power when you get above 20 percent of the mix on renewables it does a lot to the power grid and you know the, all this stuff about buyback a lot of it's just not a lot of it's the fundamental understanding of misunderstanding that the public has about what exactly happens in a nuclear plant, the safeguards in it. And I will say this, uh, the, the nuclear power plants we're using now is not the best in the world, but there was a gentleman who was a director of Oak Ridge Laboratories for many years. He was, um, name was Alvin Weinberg, and he helped develop the light water reactor back in 1949. But he was one of the first to talk about global warming. He was one of the first to talk about the present dangers of the light water reactor. And he dedicated his life to finding a viable alternative, which was the thorium molten salt reactor. They ran a successful one in the 1960s. Uh, they shut the program down in 1973 because of some craziness from the uh, director of the Atomic Energy Commission at that time. They were trying to pursue a fast breeder reactor, but that didn't work out. They wasted almost eight eight billion dollars on it and it never went anywhere but now i think the biden administration with this new climate change bill is finally putting some money into the development of safer cheaper uh nuclear power and it's going to remain a very viable alternative to it i can send you a couple of links in the chat that will get to it but again renewables are not going to cut it if anybody thinks that the world's going to run completely on renewables I would consider you nuts, to be honest with you. There's my rebuttal. Okay, next person, uh, who, uh, who wants to go next? Margaret, did you want to go next? 
Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll give you. Um, I think, well, one is that uh, the renew the current renewables, the real renewables that we have is uh, solar, hydro, um, hydroelectric power, um, uh, the what they I, there's a project up at Loyola where they put a a thing down way down in the ground and, and it's a lot warmer there and they warmed up stuff using that that was really very interesting i mean there's there's all kinds of things that are potentially um uh, non-fossil fuel non non um nuclear but in terms of the money that's available we're subsidizing the nuclear industry with millions of dollars billions of dollars every year with these bailouts and uh and putting uh doing new uh old plants that should be out of that should be decommissioned and that's going to be millions of dollars but we're putting in money to keep them going and you know the 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 safety of that is 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 fairly questionable, in fact, in, in my opinion. And I am not an expert, so this is like an ex not an expert analysis per se. However, to build a nuclear power plant is millions of dollars and significant time and like 10 years. And the this eight-year business with the thorium. Yeah, I, you know, that I think still remains to be seen, regardless of all of that. But it, it's significant money, it's significant time, and the main problem is the waste. We cannot, we do not have any way of safely disposing of any of the waste that's produced in nuclear power plants. All of it, it has various half-lives depending on which isotope you're talking about. Uh, plutonium is 90,000 year half-life. Uranium 238 is uh, 400, 200 million year, billion years or something. I mean, you, you know, the human, okay, so let's just say, Plutonium, which is a significant amount of the of the waste products that are in nuclear power plants, it's all different kinds of things. Each plant produces one ton of waste every year, and we have about a hundred plants in this country. That's a hundred tons every year. Now it's different kinds. There's low level and high level and all kinds of things, but if you look at just plutonium, it's ninety thousand years, and it take if you have a ton of plutonium, which I don't know, maybe you do have with all the plants, the total plant, I don't know that. But if you have a ton of plutonium in 90,000 years, you will have a half a ton of plutonium that is just as dangerous as the ton. And it doesn't take that much plutonium to just obliterate known life on the earth. It really does not take that much. We brought up this stuff from from underneath the ground where it's been safely away from life for millions of years. And we brought it out into the atmosphere and now we're spreading it. And when we have waste products from nuclear power plants, we spread it. All of the plants in Illinois, and we have the most plants of anybody in the country, have had problems with leaks, and with things getting into the into the water, into the ground, into the air, periodically, the plant is required to uh, to let the gases inside escape that have radioactive products in it. So the 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 thing is, well, it escapes into the atmosphere. So it's, the solution to pollution is dilution. But you know, it's not if you breathe that in. If you breathe that in, you're done. You're toast. That little bitty microscopic speck of whatever it is, you're toast. There was there was significant. There was a whole bunch of radioactive tritium 
that was that was leaked into the ground over uh, uh, one of the power plants. I don't remember which one, Clinton or something, west of of Chicago, over a period of ten years. And and the Nuclear Regulatory Agency knew about it, but it was like below their level of whatever. So they just said, okay, that's fine. That's documented. That's documented. And we don't know what the effects of this is because it's been tested. It's been done on uh, white male 30 year olds who weigh 150 pounds. It's not been tested on developing fetuses. It's not been tested on women. And there's, there's some, uh, some research that seems to show that women have worse effects than men do when they're exposed because of whatever increased metabolic rates or whatever it is. And certainly we know the effects of radiation on, on developing embryos and fetuses. It's not, it is tetragenic, it, it produces mutations and, um, and it's extraordinarily dangerous. And so thorium fits right in there because you know the the uh, you know you you cannot guarantee that it's absolutely going to be safe. You cannot do that. This is something that you have to have a hundred percent. And human beings have never, in the history of humanity, developed a system that's a hundred percent. Never. So um, you know you, it, it's just you know it's. It, 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 it's just nuts as far as I'm concerned. And I think if we put that subsidies, that we subsidize the insurance on it, because every 10 years or whatever, they pass an act that after a certain millions of dollars of damage that an accident would cause, the insurance doesn't cover it anymore. We cover it with our tax dollars. And those any accidents at any of those power plants is going to run in the billions of dollars. If we stop those kinds of subsidies, if we stop the subsidies that, that we're doing with things, if we really you know, put that into research and development for solar and, um, and the other forms of renewable, safe energy, that's a hell of a lot cheaper has it can do uh, create a lot more jobs for people that uh, can you know can really provide for the energy needs because all of this research even though it's not being well funded we've shown some significant increases in and in uh, in the efficiency and and the production of energy from these sources over the last 10 years, it's been significant. So, you know, let's stop this crazy nutsy thing. <laughs> a lot of money for some people, but puts us all at risk. Okay, and that's a good report. All right, Charlie, I guess uh, you're next, so go ahead. All right, first of all, I'd like to thank our speaker for a very nice, uh, very nice presentation, and please spread the word to your associates at Cub if they have any other areas like to make a presentation. We certainly would welcome them. I will be eclectic as usual. Number one, I was affiliated with, and they spoke at the college here, an organization called the Kapow, Citizens Against the Privatization of Water. And despite what Jake says, we looked at public versus private provision of utilities across the state of Illinois, the United States, and in other countries. And every single instance that private companies were operating utilities, the co consumer, the customers, the residents of the locale paid for it. So I don't know where he's gathering his data, but we, the organization, actively opposed the opposition to the privatization 
versus public operation of utilities after many, many years of research. First of all, I believe we should, secondly, we should nationalize energy across the nation. It's time, this is too vital and central an element in our economy and our lives. To leave it up to the private sector, again, is to open it up to, we see here, uh, fraudulent operations who have no concept of ecological concerns whatsoever, but strictly in it for profit. It's a capitalist system. And you've got to rid this. This is too central an element in our lives that it should be under public control. Uh, the public sector has not done an admirable clean job of doing so. And the frauds continue to this day as evidence by the discussion we had earlier. Number three, regarding thorium, I'm not gonna get too much of it. At least 25 times I've heard that a thorium reactor was going to be started. What happens was they, they do a solicitation for investors and no one comes forth. That's why they're relying on government. And in Asia, they're doing the same thing. They have no attraction to the private sector investor. Another thing about thorium reactors are is that they're mythical devices. And they will tell you it does this or that or many other things when it's very easy to say what, what one does or doesn't do when not one of them exists in the world. So it's like a big rock candy mountain or something here. Um, a thorium reactor is in fact a traditional reactor in every sense of the word. Thorium is simply used to get it started and running. And soon after that, it operates in an identical fashion to any reactor that's out there today. So anyone to tell you it's new technology is nonsensical. Uh, the Thorium Alliance consists of about 10 or 12 guys who could fit in one room. So I don't think there's any widespread authority. I don't think there's any widespread attraction for this approach. Um, but Another thing the thoriums don't seem to realize is we have developed, and we're developing even further today, something called the grid. And we've heard plenty of examples here tonight in which there's community socialist sharing of energy production and usage. And there's no reason not to expand upon that and discard the methods of the past, which was centralized uh, everything in one, all eggs in one basket type of approach. Um, anyone who says that any sort of nuclear technology is safe, I'm sorry, is conceivably intoxicated. Nuclear reactors produce the worst form of pollution known to mankind, colorless, odorless, and deadly in microscopic amounts, one micro dot. To produce a device that makes this is antithetical to the purpose of the ecological movement in the United States. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, another thing about regional applications, that there is many, many approaches uh, towards regional provision of services. I deal with it very often, all the time, called the Regional Transportation Authority, which provides public transit. Uh, there's also a regional structure uh, to some extent for public libraries. Um, you find this in other locations, in particular Toronto, in which they uh, have gone to a regional uh, structure for various services uh, for the municipality with measures, great degree of success and satisfaction by the public. It began in the 70s and continues on today. So there's plenty of examples of it as a sensible approach. We all reside in one bioregion known as the Great Lakes Basin, 
Um, and there's no reason we shouldn't act together collectively for the provision and use of municipal uh, uh, services. Uh, I think that's about it. Thank you very much. Please come again for an update, um, Marina, and uh, thank you. Jake, you wanna rebut? Yeah, Marina, thank you for your talk. Uh, I just wanna respond to what Charlie just said because I think you're taking my comments out of context. What I was saying, I'm opposed I'm opposed to privatization of the water utilities. But what I was saying about the electric utility here in Chicago particularly, I don't think it will I don't think it would work very well because it's tech it's technically very complicated. And I saw what was happening at the at, at the Energy Environment Committee thirty years ago when they were talking talking about the possibility of privatizing it. I remember sitting through one hearing where I could tell from the questions that they were asking, this, this expert came, this, this, I, I think he was an electrical engineer who was not with ComEd, he was with a private uh, private company, I don't remember the name of the company. And he, 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 they, were, they were contracted out to the city to do st studies on reliability of the system. Remember there was a time when there were power outages going on, one of which caused a serious fire which killed people. Uh, on the somewhere on the west side, so he was so he was hired by the city to do reliability studies on the system. And he came and de did a report, and I don't think what he said was all that complicated. But some of the aldermen were just floored with what he had to say, and they said right then and there, "No, I don't. I don't want the city messing with it because it's above their head, and they'll probably even probably end up making it worse." That's just my. Yeah, and so in, 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 no, it's not stupid at all. It's very smart. Wait, wait, um, people I'm, in elective office are dumb. Finish. It's just rebuttal time. Okay, let me finish. I, 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 Everyone I, in government. Let me, let me. You can, you can, you can, you can talk after I'm finished. This is my. Everyone time. in government Where, is dumb. No, I'm saying they, they, they it was just under the over the head. They did not, they don't understand it. They don't know enough to be able to able to operate it properly. What I, I remember I remember saying this all to uh, my friend Jean Ash, who was my alderman in Evanston at the time, and I said to her, "It's not it's not like it's not like the city be running the system on a day to day basis. They hire." They'd hire a contractor to do do day to day work. And her immediate response was, "They'd probably hire the wrong contractor." That's what they did when they set up the cable television system at Evanston. They hired a contractor who didn't know what he was doing, and they got all kinds of calls and complaints from constituents who were complaining that they were paying for cable service which they weren't getting. Eventually, they straightened out the problem, but she didn't she didn't think that the city was in any position to set up a municipal uh, municipal electric system. Um, in terms in terms of socializing socializing the power grid on a national system, I think that could be a disaster because again you'd be point, you would be appointing people who, who how would it work you'd be appointing people to set up the system and who would be appointed they'd be appointed from ComEd and from the electric from the electric utility companies and you essentially be nationalizing private utility companies and they'd still be in it for profit. I don't think that would take the proper motive out of it at all. Employees. What? Civil service employees. Yeah, but I, you, you, I'm saying the system, it would end up being, again, you'd run into the same kind of technocratic stuff, and you, it, 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 the whole thing would end up being skewed in such a way that that uh, the private the private the private companies would still end up making making big bucks off of it at, at consumer expense. Just, if you look at what's going on, you look at what's going on in the Soviet Union. I don't know what's going on in Russia now. During the Soviet Union, the, the all all the utility companies were nationalized, and what happened? The electric utility they had more nuclear power plants probably than any other place in Europe, other than France. They had more nuclear power plants than we did. And if you look at the Chernobyl power plant, that's not just a nuclear reactor. That's a uh, that's a plutonium production. It, it's a dual purpose reactor. It generates electricity, but it also produces plutonium for atom and bomb production. So that's what would happen if we had a nationalized energy system. That, that's would all. Would be making bombs. 
Okay. Uh, Illinois. Yeah, yeah. In Soviet Union, they made a lot of bombs. Yeah, that's why they. That's why they put. It. Well, they're not making bombs. Are you out of your mind? Of course, they're making bombs. They're making bombs. To, they were making bombs. I'm. I'm saying. Is that in Illinois? Are, Charlie. No. I'm saying not, not not directly no, but I'm saying the Department of Energy was set up was set up to set up. Uh, 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 Department of Energy is really the Department of uh, of Nuclear Weapons because that's what they that's what, really what they do. And some some of the, some of the waste from ComEd is sold to the Department of Energy for atomic bomb uh, production. We know that for a fact. The, the two, the two, the two, uh, the two systems are inter- interrelated. And what I'm saying is, if you nationalize, if you nationalize the energy grid, that's what's likely to come of it. We, 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 we end up produ- we end up using the system to produce more, more uh, plutonium for nuclear weapons. Okay, Jake. If that's it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Else okay. to, but uh, we got a few more minutes to go. Um, if not, I'll let Mariana, uh, I'm sorry, Marina, get the last word in and uh, we'll then adjourn and I'll keep the Zoom call open if you guys want to haggle it out. So, Mar- Marina, why don't you go ahead and give us the last word? You can rebut the rebutters or you can just say good. <laughs> presentation and having some thoughts and things to say. It was interesting and fun to hear everybody's perspectives as we went down the nuclear rabbit hole. Um, (laughs) I think I would like to finish by saying, in my opinion, the most important thing that we need to do is transition away from fossil fuels and start thinking about first electrification of our buildings. Um, So I know there's a lot of uh, action around heat pumps right now and research on how to make heat pumps work well in cold climates. Um, So I think that's a big thing and just making sure we're electrifying, even switching from gas to electric stoves, which I know some people have qualms about, but I've read a few studies about um, health effects of gas stoves in the home. Um, Another thing is um, making improvements to the grid and making sure it is Um, reliable and able to take on that extra electric um, production. And I think nationalizing the grid is an interesting idea. Um, We work with, or we kind of follow up on different grid operators. I guess Illinois has PJM and MISO. So I know um, Ameren, the downstate utility, was ordered by the ICC to run a report on what it would look like to switch between MISO to PJM, which obviously isn't nationalizing, but it's just interesting that that's even a possibility and kind of reminds you that it's all kind of made up anyways, in a sense. So, you know, um, so yeah, I think those are the main things. Also, I do believe batteries, energy storage, and a good grid are the future if we want renewables to work for us. And by renewables, I mean um, solar and wind. I mean, right now with our current situation, if we had all solar and wind, I don't think it would work out. We need to, you know, get caught up in those regards in order for that to work. Um, So those are my main opinions on those things. Um, And in terms, I also don't agree with uh, privatization. So I think CUB has actually a pretty interesting map on our website for water. Um, and it's mapping out uh, public utilities um, that are being privatized. So it helps to keep track of what's going on. So I would recommend that resource for people who are interested. Um, and in general with the whole nuclear versus no nuclear, um, I think one important thing to remember with all of our clean energy transition is, you know, who are the people who are going to be near these plants, what, who, which people are going to be affected the most, even with things like lithium mining for um, electric vehicles and batteries, um, what communities are we interrupting in that process? Because I know there is a lithium mine in Nevada I think it's Nevada, that's 50 miles from a reservation. And um, I think as we transition away from fossil fuels, we should avoid hurting the same people who were harmed 
buy fossil fuels themselves. If we're doing it two times over, that doesn't make sense either. So I think a just transition is an important thing to keep in mind as well. Um, and just to finish off, if you do have any further specific questions on how you can access solar um, for your own residential um, and power yourself um, with solar, then definitely make sure to reach out to Cub. Um, and if you ever have any questions about, you know, we were talking about alternative suppliers earlier, you want to make sure you're getting a um, good deal, then you can always reach out to Cub. But I think those are my main uh, closing points there. Okay. And yeah. Thank you for having me on tonight. It was a lot of fun. All right. This will now terminate our session of the College of Complexes. Thank you for everybody, and please stick around for what we call yeah, our after party. Thank you. Bars. So, uh, Mermaid. Thank you. I gotta run. Goodbye. It's nice seeing everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.